Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to episode 29 of GBR, where we're all about taking care of business in the world of guitar. And you definitely won't get this anywhere else. Thanks for joining us. So once again, I'm happy to have on the show today another highly talented musician that I've also been a fan of since the mid-90s and who's truly had, as we say in the title, an incremental rise to prominence, which he'll explain as we welcome guitarist Peter White. I think you'll find out a number of things about Peter that you might not have known, one of which is that guitar is not the only instrument he excels at. He's made a huge name for himself over four decades in the smooth jazz realm, but he'll talk to us in much detail about how he's done so well and what is generally a tough business for most. So stay tuned for that coming up in just a few moments. By the way, you may have noticed that we introduced a new introduction to the show today. Actually, I, I don't know if I've ever introduced an introduction before, but that's what it is. I've said it before that uh, this show will likely always be a work in process. So I thought it was time to update the front end a bit. After all, I, I created the first intro when I produced the trailer for the show back in uh, December of 2017. The show has evolved a lot since then, so I think it was time. Um, I suspect, too, that we'll begin to see some minor graphic changes that will be more like updates than radical departures. In fact, it reminds me of a piece I saw some years back about the evolution of the General Electric uh, company's GE logo over many decades. Very interesting piece. And the changes were very incremental so that there was no confusion along the way with a very established brand. So I would watch closely or you may miss it. <laughs> the other thing that we're doing is that you've probably noticed we're bringing on more players onto the show to talk about their own experiences in the business of guitar. This is entirely consistent with our mission since the very beginning of the show when we defined our audience as anyone with a business or professional connection to our guitar-related world, from guitar builders to guitar players and just about anyone in between. And you can expect to see a very balanced array of guests on the show between players and industry people of all kinds, but there are no hard or fast rules. One thing that might help us a bit is hearing from you about the show. Your input is valuable to us. We read and respond to every inbound message, unless, of course, it's spam or something completely inappropriate. So don't hesitate. Visit the contact page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com. We'd love to hear from you. And while we wait patiently for those cards and letters to come in, here's something completely different. Well, Peter White has enjoyed a long career that uh, has included nearly 20 years as an integral part of British singer-songwriter Al Stewart's band. His own solo recording and touring career began in the early to mid-90s and has expanded steadily to the point where I would say he's a household name in the smooth jazz world. Along the way, he's collaborated with some of the best musicians on the planet, and all of that continues today. And there's much more to talk about, so let's do just that as Peter White joins us right here and right now. Well, Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show with us, and welcome to GBR. Thanks for coming on. Well, thank you very much, and it's great to, great to be here. And, uh, nice to talk to you. Well, thanks. Uh, okay, so... Uh, you know, I got to tell you, I've really been trying to come up with uh, some fresh language to start the interviews off and, and still get around to what I like to get around to, which is the foundational question. So I think in your case, I'm just going to start off with something like, uh, what made you think you could become a professional musician? How about that? Well, Jeff, that is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for somebody to ask me that. <laughs> For years. And I'm somebody. so glad I could accommodate. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it was, I, I obviously had an answer to this because when I was 18, 
uh, I left school and all my friends went to college and I didn't. Mm. And they, I must have known at that point that there was something for me uh, in music because that was pretty much what consumed me in those days. And I knew that I had talent. I knew that I could play, I, mean, I could play guitar and piano both pretty well at that point because I learned a lot from listening. Well, on the guitar, it was mostly from listening to the radio, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. because I didn't have that many records. Records were very expensive, didn't have much money then. I had piano lessons. So those two things I knew were going to help me. And I knew that I could listen to music and I could pick it up pretty easily. And in rock music, which is what I was pretty much interested in at that time, that was really all that, that mattered. Nobody was going to ask me to read any music. Uh, I was pretty certain. And, and in fact, that was the case for at least 20 years wow. <laughs> that I was a professional musician, that no one ever asked me to read a piece of music. That's even amazing. Though I could, That's even amazing. though I could read music. <laughs> you could. You could read. You did yeah, learn I could read me. music on, for the piano. I never really learned music of, related to the guitar. I didn't learn that way. I just kind of learned by ear. So even today, if you put a piece of music in front of me, I could play it on the piano, but on the guitar, I'd have to think, well, what is this note? <laughs> Where do I start? Where do I put my fingers? Because I never really learned like that. And that might, that might surprise people that I, that I can read music, but I don't relate it to the guitar. I relate it to the piano. So at, at the age of 18, I must have had a lot of confidence in myself that I could actually make it. And the, the bands that I was interested in um, at that time, uh, Led Zeppelin, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Genesis, mm -hmm. you know, they were all writing their own music. And I thought, I can do this, come up with music, uh, embellish someone else's musical suggestion. I could improvise. I learned to do that by listening to Eric Clapton. Mm -hmm. I, I can do that. By the way, I I'd, I'd barely could play a major scale on the guitar at that point. I didn't think it was that important. <laughs> um, it was all pentatonic up to that point. It was just playing the blues. I mean, everyone in England, which is where I grew up, of course, uh, was in totally obsessed with the blues, uh, much, much more so than than the American. Yeah, I kind of remember that. I do remember that. Yeah. yeah, it's the '60s, and it started with a guy called Alexis Corner, quite honestly, and um, he started a blues a band called Blues Incorporated. Sure. In the early '60s, and this is how the Stones started because they listened to him and they really got into the American blues. And the English guys would go to the, I don't know, they they go to find imports import albums from um, from America. And I never did this, of course. I just listened to Eric Clapton. I didn't realize that the blues started much, much earlier than that. But yeah, everything on the guitar I played was the blues. And when I did play piano, I could, I could play scales on the piano. And that's how I learned. I, played, I learned to play classical music. Uh, but there were kind of two worlds that didn't really meet for me. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, but, but having those two abilities, I could play the piano. I could do a pretty fair imitation of some of Keith Emerson pieces because ELP had started. I was 16, I think, when Emerson, Lake and Palmer started. And I was, I loved that first Emerson, Lake and Palmer album. Great stuff. And I learned yeah. to play just about every keyboard riff. Uh, I, I would never say that I'm, that I'm, you know, a, a budding Keith Emerson, but, you know, I did a pretty good job of imitating him. In fact, when I went for my first serious audition in London, uh, when I was 20 years old, that's what I played. They said, we know that you can play guitar and piano. And we're interested in someone that's a multi-instrumentalist. And I thought, well, this is this is a leg up here. Um, you know, if I was just a guitar player, I don't think they would have hired me. But I played uh, some Keith Emerson stuff that I'd learned. And they said, great, you're in. So you had and some that, added value there, obviously. Yeah. So, and by the way, as, as I was walking towards that audition, which was in London, which is a big deal for me because I lived in the countryside and I took the train down there. I had a wave of fear come over me as I was walking down the street towards the place uh, where they had the audition. And I, and I thought, what am I doing? I've had all this confidence up to this point. All of a sudden, my confidence just dropped away. I'm going to be up against people who are much more experienced than me, much more knowledgeable, much more confident than me, much more self-esteem than me. What do I think I'm doing? I'm a kid growing up in the countryside and listening to some Emerson, Lake and Palmer albums, copying Eric Clapton on the guitar. Who, do th who the hell do, th do I think I am? And yet I walked right through that fear. And this is probably the biggest lesson that I ever learned in my life. I walked through the fear. I walked into the room. I played. I got the job. I started my career in music. I could have easily turned back at that moment and just gone back and given up 
got a job working in the bank and I'd be there today. So this is a great lesson. You know, everyone has fear, of course, but you might, you don't let the fear make your decisions. You walk through it. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's the, And that's been stated many, many different ways philosophically. There's lots of different analogies, but it's basically walking into the storm and walking through it and not uh, running away from it while it chases you the, the yeah, whole, because, the you whole know, way. You, you can have every confidence in your head and, and yet you don't have any self-esteem because that's self-esteem is, is what happens when confidence leaves you. <laughs> this yeah. is the way I think of it. Yeah, well, that's, confidence, that's, is, that's right. confidence is when everything is going well. You know, you know you're in your element, you're comfortable. When all that is taken away, all you have left is self-esteem. And uh, even though I had very little self-esteem at that point, that's when it started to build. And I said, no, I am going to go through with this. I am going to go walk into that room, even though I have no confidence. I, I barely left school. I've been working in a factory <laughs> ever since I left school. I have no experience as a professional musician. Yet I am going to go in there like I own the place. And um, that's how I got started in music. You know, within three months, that band that I joined had broken up. <laughs> the band was called Principal Edwards Magic Theater. Oh. And uh, they were actually... Uh, on John Peel's Dandelion label. If you remember John Peel, sure. uh, he was a very famous DJ in England. In the, I remember in the, the name. I remember the yeah, name very well. Very famous English DJ. Uh, probably the most famous in terms of, you know, rock, the rock, the rock music scene and the kind of the underground scene, as we called it. And he kind of championed this band. But they, they broke up within a few weeks, actually, that I joined them. <laughs> and I don't think it was my fault, by the way. <laughs> and, and then you were faced with that... Um common challenge well, of what now right well yes what now as i um i actually put together a very ill-conceived plan to put a band together of the people that i'd met in london and go and rehearse in a shed somewhere in my hometown of lechworth garden city and the freezing cold in the middle of a field where there was probably no, i didn't even check if there was an electricity there <laughs> but at the very moment that this ill-conceived plan <laughs> was was going ahead i got a phone call and this is very significant because um, I had only just moved into this flat in London after moving from, you know, living with my mum in the countryside. And for the first time in my life, I lived in a flat that had a telephone because growing up, we didn't have a telephone. Wow. Even when I went to my uh, to get my first auditions, you know, to go to London, I had to use a payphone. And uh, when they called me back, I said, just call my neighbor. You know, <laughs> oh. the, so I could have been out at that moment when that phone rang. You know, in those days, this is 1975. There was no answering machine. Right, right. There was no call waiting. There was no, there's no, there's no nothing. No one's going to take a message for you. I just happened to be home and um, I could have eased, I could have been out shopping, you know, <laughs> taking a walk. Uh, this guy started talking to me and in this sort of quasi half American English accent, which I couldn't place. And he started talking about Al Stewart. And I, and I started to realize this is Al Stewart's manager. Ah. And he wants to find someone that can join Al's band for a short tour of England that can play keyboard. And that's all he wanted. He wanted someone that could come in, play keyboard, learn the songs, play keyboard, do a short tour. I said, well, I can do that. And my life changed in, in an instant. For the next 20 years, um, I played in Al Stewart's touring band, also recorded with him, wrote songs with him. And this was just a case of being in the right place at the right time. And the reason that he called me his name was Luke O'Reilly, uh, because because he was a partner with Miles Copeland in a company called British Talent Managers, and they also managed Al Stewart and also the band that I had joined that broke up, <laughs> Principal Ed, as a, a Principal Edwards Magic Theatre. So, because I had this is what I call the proximity effect, because I joined this band even though they broke up, I got to know people who one day mentioned my name to someone else, who mentioned to someone else. Uh, got to Al Stewart's manager. He needed a keyboard player at that moment. Uh, not only was I a guitar player, but I could play keyboards. And I got my gig with Al. I did a short audition. I learned some songs by ear because there were no charts then. And bingo, I, within a few days, I was touring. Uh, the first gig we did was Edinburgh in uh, Scotland. Well, my life changed. Instantly. And, and for the first time in my life, I stayed in the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> Big changes. Um, so these are, these are some things. And of course, I you know, became aware of your work wasn't till the mid nineties, but there was, um, 
you know, there was this period of time that you've described that um, you were working, as you mentioned, before you started making your own records. And I know you've talked about some of the early lessons uh, that you picked up and maybe you could, uh, you know, embellish a little bit on, on those years and some of the other things that were very significant that happened over that time. I know that you've mentioned a few of those things to me. Well, yeah, I started with Al Stewart when I was 20 and I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot about how to be on stage, how to talk to the audience. You talk to the audience like you're just like I'm talking to you. Um, he never did that. Hey, how's everybody doing? You know, and I can't, <laughs> and to this day, I have never done that. I don't have that voice. I don't. I only have this. I only have one voice. Which it's is the, the voice, voice you're talking with right now. I've yeah, heard. It. This is the only voice I have, <laughs> yeah. uh, Jeff. So, I I, I, I sometimes cite J uh, David Letterman. You know, I, I always loved watching his show, and he had the same voice. He would never change his voice. He would say, uh, welcome, uh, Paul Schaefer in the band, ladies and gentlemen. And I thought, well, then that's the voice I'm going to use because that's the only voice I have. I'm not going to try to do that in a big operatic, <laughs> hey, I just don't have it. I'm so not sure it would work for out. you either. <laughs> you know, just be yourself, be yourself on stage. Just talk to the audience, tell stories, tell he used to make stories, he makes stuff up, and I tried that and I realized that was not for me. I just can't do it. So everything that I say now on stage is true. I just talk about experiences that have happened to me, what things mean to me. And it is just like this. I mean, I've, I've watched yeah. a lot of your shows and uh, you know, on video and other places, and uh, that's the way you talk. Yeah. That's right. There, there was a – and yeah, the, this – I didn't make my first – solo CD until I'd been playing with Al for 15 years. And there were a lot of reasons for that because I didn't see any outlet for the kind of acoustic guitar because by that time I, I was really much more into acoustic guitar. When I joined Al Stewart, I was, you know, a lot into piano, organ, electric guitar, but he, he put a nylon string acoustic guitar in my hand literally one day and said, I think you should play this. And it changed my life again. Yeah, we know because, where that went. <laughs> yeah, because there was a song on the Year of the Cat album, which we re, uh, released in 1976, where I am playing the nylon string guitar. It's a song called On the Border. And I was playing with a flat pick then because I didn't really know how to play nylon string guitar mm -hmm. finger style. Uh, but I learned later. But um, that was just the best way for me to play back then. And I listen to that now. You know, yeah, man, I can see the spark that started on that song that led me to where I am today. And it was Al Stewart that said to me, this is your instrument, you should play this. You know, forget the steel string acoustic, forget the electric guitar, forget the keyboard, all that stuff. Yeah, it's great, but you sound like everyone else. When you play this instrument, the nylon string guitar, you sound different. And I thought, really? So it just kind of, he just literally put it in my hand. And from that moment on, I became known as that guy that plays all those instruments. But we really only remember when you played that one song. Wow. Because in his show, I would be playing piano, electric guitar, steel string acoustic. But when I came out front with a nylon string guitar and played that song on the border, and people would really take notice. Did your instrument array and the, the types of instruments that you were playing in the shows, did, it, did that change over time with him? Uh, did you move more toward uh, the nylon string or was it still the same mix? No? I did. Um, I've seen subsequently, I recorded many more songs with a nylon string guitar. But, you know, it, I was in his touring band for a total of 20 years. And during that time, there were many changes. I and think. sometimes I, sometimes I would play electric guitar. Sometimes I play piano. Sometimes I play organ. Sometimes I'd sing. I'd, I'm not a great singer, but I would sing a little bit. Um, he encouraged me to play the accordion, oh, <laughs> which which I have played subsequently on many albums, including my own um, a Polish singer called Basha. Sure. I played her yeah. albums, accordion. I played accordion on Al Stewart albums. I just played recently on a Brian Culbertson album. Accordion. Accordion. He oh, asked no. me to play accordion. Well, once yeah. again, there is something that See? I absolutely didn't know. And I wonder if, I wonder how many other people know that, Peter. Yeah, if, <laughs> if I didn't play accordion, I wouldn't have got that gig. I wouldn't be, you know, the more instruments that you can play competently, the more chance you are going to get of being hired over the guy that doesn't. Well, that's a fundamental lesson, isn't it? That's a very fundamental lesson. Now, I can't sing very well. I can fake some background vocals and I can do a little bit of Elvis sometimes <laughs> in my Christmas show. But if you can sing and play an instrument, you will get hired twice over the guy that cannot sing. 
And if you can sing a high harmony, you've already replaced a female background singer. You will work for the rest of your life. I guy, the guy that played in my band, he played drums in my band, but he had a great high singing voice. He got hired away to play with Elton John, played with him for 15 years. And they're still playing with him, I think, on El- El- Elton's farewell tour. Uh, his name is John Mahan. So now I can't sing, but I can play two different instruments pretty well. And, and a few other, I play harmonica a little bit in my show. And this all helps. If you only play one instrument, if you only do one thing, you better be Pavarotti. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. Because that, if you're it. not, <laughs> you're going to lose out to the guy that can, oh, can you play this? Oh, we need someone that can fill in on bass on one song while a bass player plays the violin. Oh, can you play this a keyboard part? Yeah, you will get the job. That's such great advice, too. And really for, for, for people that... Um are listening that are in that in that stage where they can uh, make that kind of shift probably some very good advice yeah it, well it's better when you start when you're younger you know i would think so i just i just had a natural fascination for musical instruments and uh, so i just used to pick them up harmonica is something i started when i was 11 years old and i actually became the national british junior harmonica champion for two years running only because there were very few boys, all boys, no girls. I don't know why. I just had to be better than two other boys, I think. Have you uh, played harmonica on some of your uh, your own albums at all? I played harmonica on one song on one album, which was a Christmas album I recorded oh. about 10 years ago. But I, I hope to do more. But, you know, I, I, I kind of gave it up for many years. And I'm just now getting back into it. So I'm never going to be too Thillman. But, you know, <laughs> just enough that I can play a little bit on stage and kind of surprise people because, you know, you pull this thing out of your pocket. That's the last thing people expect is <laughs> from a guitar player. Yeah, you're going to get really good <laughs> reaction for stuff like that. I, I can visualize yeah. that. I, I really can. But, but anyway, you know, back to the question, which was, how did I make my transition to solo artist? Well, uh, Al Stewart had already given me the nylon string guitar, so that kind of became my signature sound. There was a radio station in Los Angeles where I, where I relocated, and I relocated there because basically Al, uh, Al Stewart had relocated there, and he wanted me to join him there to help him finish the album he was working on, which was called Time Passages, and put a band together for him in Los Angeles because he decided he'd had enough of London. And so I just followed. I had no idea this was going to be uh, me emigrating to a different country, but that's how it ended up. I, I very often in my life, I, I see this, you know, taking opportunities, not necessarily making opportunities. And I know a lot of people are big on this, but in my career, it's pretty much been, I've been in the right place at the right time. I've met the right people. I've been lucky. And someone has said to me at some point, why don't you do this? I said, fine. And I just kind of did. And that's how I ended up in Los, Los Angeles, which was exactly the right place in later years for me to become a solo artist. I met all the right people to help me. And uh, the, this radio station started in 1987 called The Wave. Well, sure. I can. Yeah, I remember when they made that transition. It used to be, uh, what was the other, what was it called? K- KMET. KMET. K- that's right. And it was the Mighty Met, and they would play Led Zeppelin every hour. And of course, I'm a huge Led that's Zeppelin right. fan. And B. Mitchell so Reed I, was there, I remember. Yes. <laughs> so, so I remember... I, once I, one day I turned on my radio expecting to hear Led Zeppelin. <laughs> and instead, I heard this band called Acoustic Alchemy. Sure, sure. I mean, it was a big, f- I, I really yeah. made the transition from a lot of people were very disgruntled when right. KMET became the wave. So, and people would say, well, it's just elevator music. But it wasn't. Well, it, no, wasn't. it wasn't. I'm, I'm listening transfixed. I'm thinking, what happened to my heavy rock station? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I'm a heavy rock fan. I know I love ACDC. I love, you know. Black Sabbath was, was, I thought, the greatest band when they started in, I was 15, I think. But anyway, I'm hearing this group playing acoustic guitar with this band behind them. And it's not necessarily jazz. No, it wasn't. Because up to, mm-hmm. up to that point, if you wanted to hear instrumental music on the radio, it was either easy listening, elevator, Muzak type music, or it was straight ahead jazz. And I, I, and I wasn't ready to be either. Of and there's no way I can ever convince someone that I'm a jazz player. So... I didn't really, I really didn't see an outlet for instrumental music until that day. I thought, wow, they're playing these guys who I learned later were from England, just like me. They're playing acoustic guitar, one nylon string, one steel string, and they have a band. And it's like rock. They're using rock rhythms. I thought, wow, it's not jazz. Maybe I can do this. And very soon after that, I heard a song from, um, from Basha that I had played on and 
I'm hearing my guitar now on the radio. Oh, and, they, then the, oh. and then they played an Al Stewart song, which was mostly instrumental, which is me playing again. And the, and the, uh, the DJ's name is Don Burns. I remember. I would absolutely remember. Don Burns, he says, sure. he says, that was Peter White. No, no, he didn't. I wanted him to say that. He said, <laughs> that was Al Stewart. <laughs> Yeah, great and voice. This, I can't do that voice. <laughs> and I thought, and I almost shouted at the radio. I said, no, that was me. <laughs> and I started to wonder, what do I have to do after being in the music business now for what, 13, 14 years? What do I have to do that I get some actual recognition for my, my playing? And I started to think, well, maybe I should make a CD and put my name on the front of it. And then when they, if they played that music, they would say, that's Peter White. Because up to that point, I'm just a sideman. And so that's how I started. I, a friend of mine who happened to be my neighbor, his name is Skipper Wise, had a recording studio that he'd built in a garage. Mm. They had a 24-track tape machine. This is before digital recording. Sure, recording. sure. Yeah. The only way really to make an album is, is on analog tape. So he says, you help me with my album, which was an album called Cl The Clock and the Moon, and I'll help you with your album. I said, sounds good. That's how I recorded my first album, pretty much. On my own, I played most of the instruments. This is where my keyboard playing helped because I learned to use a sequencer, uh, which is a Roland hardware sequencer. Mm -hmm. And I would program all the parts using uh, my keyboard skills. And, um, and then I just put, played the guitar on the top. I had a drummer friend of me program some drum parts, and that was my first album. Now, if I couldn't play keyboards, I would have had to rely on someone else to do all of my arrangements for me. And it wouldn't have come out the same. I, I, having the ability to play the keyboard enabled me to arrange all the songs and to pretty much flesh them out. Synthesizers, strings, mini moog, bass, um, clavinet, organ, whatever. And then I just played the guitar on the top, and it sounded like a whole band because I didn't have enough. I didn't have any money then to you know to hire a whole band. I didn't really know that many musicians apart from the guys that I'd been playing with in Al Stewart's band, and. Um, if you listen to that first album, you hear a lot of pop and rock influence. I'm going to have to go back and listen to it. Now. And it was only about the third album that you say you started listening to me, a promenade album. Yeah. That the more of the jazz, the jazziest stuff started to come in. So uh, tell me a little bit about what happened with the, that first album or the second one. Did you get, did you get play? Did you promote well, it? What happened? What happened was I met, a guy called Cliff Goroff, and I met him through Basha, actually. Basha was doing a promotional tour for her um, first album, which is called Time and Tide, which became huge, by the way, on um, The mm -hmm. Wave. Mm -hmm. I remember. <laughs> like every hour they were playing a Basha song. And that's where I believe I heard you first. I mean, I can tell you, that's, yeah. that's where I heard you. Yeah. So I met Cliff, who was, who was the, promo, the promo guy for Epic at that time, and... Um, I met through her because she came to visit me at a, a studio one day and she, oh, we have to visit Peter. Peter played on my album, you know, and Cliff said, great. And Cliff knew that I was Danny's brother. Danny White is the guy that uh, Basha was, was Basha's co-producer and co-writer. So he was my link, Danny, my brother, mm -hmm. to Basha. And Cliff said to me, I know you're Danny's brother. And he says, any way I can help you, anytime, don't hesitate to call me. So when I finished my first album, I still didn't have a record deal. I'd financed the entire album from touring. <laughs> and I called up Cliff. I said, Cliff, I need a record deal. He says, I'll help you. And he got me a, um, a pressing and distribution deal. It's called P&D deal mm -hmm. with a tiny record company in Glendale, California called Chase Music Group. And what that meant was that uh, they agreed to press and distribute the album. There was no advance. No. So... And Cliff says, I think I can get this played on the radio because he liked what he heard. What was the t title of the first album? It's Réveillez-vous, which is French. Okay, I'm not going to write that down. But no, <laughs> don't write it down. <laughs> it's just write down RV. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I call it now. And, uh, because my mother is French, so uh -huh. it was kind of in honor of my mom. But, and it was kind of like an awakening because Réveillez-vous means wake up oh, in okay. French. All right. So it was kind of like an awakening for me. I said, well, okay. And the, the very first title track, the, the first track on the album is a song I wrote when I woke up one morning. So I just called it Wake Up, El Réveillez-vous. <laughs> ah. I should have called it Wake Up. <laughs> and I was warned, by the way, by everybody, including my manager at the time, no one's going to understand this. 
no one will be able to pronounce it and you're making a mistake. I thought, well, I want to do it anyway. Well, Wake Up would have been a title that would be more uh, like the, the music that you wrote, late, that you've written later on and that had similar yeah. kinds of titles. Yeah. So anyway, um, I'm, I said it straight on the second album called Excusez-moi, which is actually an apology for the first album. <laughs> <clears throat> and I wrote an apology in French, <laughs> which I thought was very funny. <laughs> Did anybody on the, else? On the second album, but no one ever got it. You know, there's very often there's something on every album sleeve that's I think is very clever and funny, but nobody ever gets it. Well, so, inside, uh, inside. And it's it's not too inside, I think, but it's just funny. But um So so the so the first album, second album. And the uh, first album was, by the way, a, a lot of the songs were songs I'd actually written for Al Stewart uh, uh, in a very pop style, pop sense that he never used. So I said, well, I just turned them into instrumentals. Okay, sure. Makes sense. Did you get play? You got some airplay? I did get play. I got some airplay. And in fact, in those days, there was no singles chart for what they call smooth jazz. And in fact, there was no smooth jazz. That title didn't even exist then. Uh, yeah, it, it was, was kind of like there was some new, there was, I wasn't new sure. Adult it was new adult contemporary. Yeah. And there was, the, I always thought there was some new age on the wave, they were doing some. They were they, George they used, Winston and yeah, some of they that used kind to play stuff. New Age. Andreas Vollenweid. Sure, okay, remember exactly. him? He was yeah. huge. Yes, um, that's right. By around 1995, that all kind of was swept away, and it became more like what we know now mm -hmm. as, as smooth jazz. But before then, it was called New Adult Contemporary, and they had a chart in the Billboard magazine, and I actually got to number one on the radio chart, not based on any one song but based on accumulation of all the songs from that first album, because there were no singles then. The uh, radio stations just played whatever they liked. Ah. With what a concept. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it sounds like it did maybe better than you expected, or did you have any I had, expectations? Well, I had no expectations. Yeah, okay. uh, I didn't know that, is, is this album going to be well-received? Does anyone even care? Will it get radio play? I hope so. And they started playing it on the wave, and I remember the first time I heard it. Um, I was driving on the 405 freeway and I heard my name for wow. the first time on that the radio. That pretty wow. exciting. <laughs> you know, I've already, I'd already been a professional musician for 15 years at that point. But so this was very exciting for me. Like, well, maybe this is a new step for me. It's all I very would. gradual steps, Jeff. You know, my entire career has been very gradual. Well, that's steps. That's the way that it, that's probably the, the best way to do it. That kind of keeps your, uh, yeah. Not to mention the word foundation, but you're you're building yeah. on the foundation that you and already good, have, you know. So. And it's also a good lesson. Yeah. You know, because I'm I know younger guys say to me, "Well, what am I going to do? I you know I I didn't get so much airplay." And I said, "Look, you're already you're, you're already way ahead of me." I said, "Man, I didn't release my first album until I was 35. You know, you're only 25. You have got a lot of time ahead of you." And anyway, I can't tell you how to get airplay. I can't tell you how to write a hit song. All I know is that when I feel it, then I create it. So let That's me, all I know. let me ask you, uh, because I know that when I became familiar with you and was started buying your CDs and it, it, at what point did you feel that you really had some momentum? I mean, would, was there a point that things shifted? Um, were there any lifestyle adjustments? Did you had, did you run into any challenges, any of those kinds of things as you were kind of ramping up? My answer to you, Jeff, is once again, it was so slow. <laughs> so I didn't really notice. So we don't notice and our then, aging, right? It's, no, it's, exactly, so slow. It's, it's, it's just like that. Well, hearing myself on the radio was a huge jump. Yeah. My own song from my own album and my name on the front, uh, as opposed to me being a sideman, you know, to any other band. So that was a huge jump. Uh, doing my own show and the first full length show I did was actually on Catalina Island for the jazz tracks Catalina Island Festival, which is, has been going on since the late 80s and still carries on. In fact, I'm, being, I'm going to be playing there again uh, in October. This is October 2018. Wow. My wow. first full-length show, I was terribly nervous. It wasn't helped by the fact that it was daylight. We're playing in this ballroom, but actually it's all French windows and daylight was streaming and it was a Sunday afternoon. And I, I was very distracted by the fact that everybody's looking at me. <laughs> I'm not used to being in the center position with a microphone. I'm used to st standing at the back of the stage or on the side. And now everybody's looking at me and um, I was extremely nervous, but I got through the show and, and, and now it's funny cause I, I can, I play out 
you know, in the outdoors now all the time. Daylight doesn't bother me in the slightest. When was that first show uh, approximate to your first album? Was it actually? Like- it, it was in 1991. Okay. And my first album had already been out over a year okay. at that point. Okay. So I was still touring with Al Stewart constantly, That's and right. also That's right. and you, also with with yeah. Basha for the next oh. three or four years. In fact, okay. I didn't become a f- full solo artist until 1995, uh, where I'd already been a professional musician now yeah. for 20 years. Yeah. And I joined a tour that was called An Evening of Guitars and Saxes, which was put together by an agency here in California. And um, I went on the road with Richard Elliott, Warren Hill, and Craig Chikiso. Sure. I remember those guys. Yeah. Yeah. And although I thought it was a terrible idea at first, and that was just actually my fear once again talking to me, Mm -hmm. because all these guys have more experience than me they got more audience than me got more airplay you know all this negative stuff that just fills your head and actually looking back on it it wasn't true <laughs> no it was just my negative mind my insecurity cropping it never leaves you jeff it's always there and je- but just because it's there it doesn't mean to say you have to listen to it so um that too i happened to be the best thing i ever did because that got me started on the road to being a, a professional uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, as a professional solo artist. Sure. And that was probably and what, the mid-90s? That, that was 1995. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And that sounds about right, because I remember, I'm trying to remember the title of the, of the, is it the third album that Promenade was on, or I can't remember. Yeah, that was the third album, yeah. What was that album called? That was, that was called Promenade. Oh, okay. That's right. Okay. That's why. <laughs> All Promenade. Yes. <laughs> and the fourth album is Reflections, okay. and then uh, I was working on the fifth album, Caravan of Dreams, when I started the tour with guitars and saxes and for the first time I'm on tour playing my own music and we happened to go um, play in a town play in Fort Worth, Texas and there was a club there called Caravan of Dreams. Really? And I got the idea for the song when I was oh. when I was there which is why I called the song Caravan of Dreams and Caravan of Dreams became my most successful album to, uh, to date and it actually I think it sold over 100,000 but that was a very grad- <laughs> it was a very gradual transition it wasn't like I came out of the box and sold 100,000. That was already five years after I'd released my first album. That's really kind of how it works. I I don't know. You know, I, I, I started this uh, show, t- I don't know, 29 episodes ago. And it's very incremental. You can't be impatient. You have to build it. You have to build it week after that's week a, after week. That's a great lesson. You can't be impatient. And uh, just have to just believe in what you're doing and... Do quality work, do stuff that moves you, and the rest will follow. Well, you know, I I was going to ask you. <laughs> I had kind of a note to ask you about your about your keyboard abilities because I I got to tell you I I really didn't know any of this. I, I you know I've always thought of you as a guitarist and uh, never really gave much thought to to anything else. But it, but it does sound like uh, that was obviously a very very important part. I'm kind of wondering now, I mean, to what degree is the is the keyboard still a part of your work, a critical part of your work? Absolutely. Yeah. When I'm writing a song or arranging a song, trying to perfect it, you know, I still use MIDI a whole lot to put songs together. And very often the guitar will be the last thing I put on. I'm working on some songs now, and it's mostly keyboard work. Or I'll play it into the sequencer or into the computer, and then later I'll just edit, oh, this isn't working, I'll edit this a little bit. So, you know, sometimes said, did you actually play that keyboard part? And I say, well, I actually don't remember if I played it or if I edited it. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's all the same to me now, I'm so used to editing. Um, but yeah, a huge part. And here's a, here's a story. Um, 2015, I got back together with Al Stewart to do a kind of a reunion show in the Royal Alp Hall in London. This was May 2015, and he got back a lot of the guys that used to play with him back in England, uh, back in the 70s, and I was expecting to play guitar, but he got his original guy playing electric guitar, Tim Rennick, who's a genius, I think. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that played on Year of the Cat, even though everybody thinks it was me, it was Tim Rennick that (laughs) that played all the guitar on that song. He got another guy playing acoustic steel string, and um, I said, well, I guess I better go and play keyboards. So... I play keyboards for 80% of that show and then nylon string guitar for the, for the rest. And there's a, actually a video of this on YouTube. And if you look up Al Stewart, Royal Albert Hall, Year of the Cat, 
uh, we play the entire year of the Kent album. And there's I'm going to see you play on keyboard there. Yeah, there's a clip that somebody took from the balcony because they don't generally allow videos at the Royal Albert Hall. It's very snooty, (laughs) (laughs) and they want you to pay them ten thousand dollars, you know, if you if you record or video anything there. But somebody took video from the balcony, and there's me playing solo piano as an intro to this uh, to the Year of the Cat. And Al said to me, "I want you to play a you know solo intro, and but you have to work this song." um, What's that song from Casablanca, the movie? Oh, as you time, must remember, as time, as time, goes, time goes, by. goes by. Sure. He says, you have to work that in because the song actually mentions the movie, not by title. The song starts on a morning from a Bogart movie, and it's really about the movie Casablanca. He says, so you have to work that in. I say, oh, well, I better think about this. <laughs> so if you go and watch that, Year of the Cat, Al Stewart, Royal Albert Hall, 2015, you'll see me playing this whole improvised intro thing for about two two minutes, I think. I have a hunch a lot of people are going to be and going no, out looking at that. And then we go into Year of the Cat. And the, the, <laughs> irony is, the irony is I didn't play on the song in the studio, and that's another story. Um, because basically the guy that wrote the song with Al that played the piano didn't like me because he knew that I could play piano. Ah. And he felt, he felt I was in some way competing with him, which I wasn't. Uh, but he didn't want me in the studio when he was recording. So mm. that's why I didn't end up on that song. But um, yeah, I had, I had to practice for that show a lot because I don't practice keyboard as much as I used to. And I don't really play on stage because I always have a great keyboard player with me, you know, whether it's Greg Karukas or Ron Reinhardt or Greg Manning. Yeah. I've never seen, I've never seen it. So that's why I wouldn't have known uh, at all. So, um, with a little bit of practice, (laughs) I, I, I practice just enough to be able to keep it up. But yeah, I mean, the biggest part of the keyboard playing is that it helps me to arrange music and flesh out parts and arrangements before I even pick up the guitar. There's very few songs I actually write on guitar. And you can tell which ones those are because those are the ones that start with guitar. Got it. Pretty much the way the song starts is the way I wrote it. Do you have, uh, do you work at a home studio or do you have, uh, you know, uh, another? Uh... I have a studio that I've set up in an industrial um, like office park mm-hmm. a few miles away from my house. And the thing is, it's very quiet there. That so makes could, sense. That makes a lot and, of and sense. And for recording acoustic guitar, it's absolutely essential because as soon as you start recording acoustic guitar, it's the quietest instrument. And I play pretty quietly. You can hear every plane going overhead. You can hear every car going by. You can hear birds twittering. So because you have to have the microphone turned up so high to get the guitar that it starts to pick up everything else. So... Um, that's the main thing. That's it's just a place I can go and it's quiet. Nobody comes by. Nobody bothers me. All I do there is make music. Do you spend a lot of time there? Or do you spend your days there? Is that... Some days I spend there. Yeah. I was there yesterday. Do you spend any nights there? <laughs> I have spent nights there. Yes. <laughs> I have. I can. Yeah. I can lay out on the floor and, and take a nap. You know, I, I, uh, I don't know, having that dedicated space. Well, that sounds great. I mean, it just sounds great. Where there's, I mean, no, I, dist- where there's no distraction. Yeah, that's got to be great. And, you know, we talk to a lot of folks that, that have home studios now, which is certainly a big deal. But, but uh, I mean, I, and I'm one of them. You know, I have a radio studio here in, in, yeah. in, in our place. Yeah. And um, I never leave, you know. And sometimes we have to leave. Um, so uh, I can see the real the real benefit to that. Uh, you know, a lot of players that, that we talk to a little bit about the business side of things, they sort of tell me that they've had to take many or most aspects of their careers into their own hands. It's not everybody. Some of them have created their own labels or touring companies, that sort of thing. And, and I do think our listeners always like to hear of some of what we think of and we've been told is the inside baseball stuff about how things uh, really work. So I'm kind of uh, curious if uh, you could tell us a little bit about how your career functions. Uh, You know, what what does that look like? One of the most significant things in my career um, that have helped me in business is having a good manager. And Steve Chapman is my manager. And I met him because he was a drummer. And he played in Al Stewart's band back in the 70s. That's how long I've known him. Oh, wow. And he was on the road with many different bands, including Poco for a while. Mm-hmm. And also with Spencer Davis. Wow. Spencer Davis group. Sure. Uh, this is way after Steve Winwood left, of course. Yeah. Um, but it was in the Spencer Davis 
group that he started to realize that they would get to cities and nobody had booked a hotel. Oh, man. <laughs> For instance, he said, man, I, I, maybe I should <laughs> – Maybe I should start doing, you know, plan tour planning and, and uh, then at least I know that we have a place to stay. And, and that's how we got into to road manager. And from road manager, then he started to become a – he became Al Stewart's personal manager. And then when I told him that I was thinking of making an album on my own, he says, great, I'll be your manager. I said, great. And that's how it happened. We've been, been together 28 years now. And he talks to the record company. I've always released my album on a record company. I've never started my own record label, uh, as many people have. Right. Uh, but he's he still thinks that there's there's a benefit to having a record company that can spend money on promotion. Well, I'm sure there is. And um, I don't have to worry about any of that. So uh, my last three albums, four albums, actually, were on uh, Concord. And I'm um, very happy with them. So he's the and, interface. Yeah, he talks to the record yeah. company. He talks to the agent. I mean, quite honestly, there was this guy that used to come to my shows in New York and he was a very friendly guy. His name is Fred. And it was only years later that I realized that's my agent. Oh, <laughs> how about that? Steve says, don't you realize that was your agent? Oh, oh geez. Because <laughs> I never talked to the agent. <laughs> but the agent, uh, if it wasn't for the agent, why do you have an agent? This is a good question. Because the agent demands that the venue or the promoter who's hiring me gives them 50% up front. And this means if the gig goes down, if the gig is canceled, if the promoter goes belly up, if the venue goes belly up, I still can cover the costs that I've incurred buying airfares, hiring musicians, buying equipment. If I didn't have that 50% as a guarantee, I would be out all that money. Yeah, that's very smart. And so and the agent generally only deals with promoters and venues that he has a working relationship with. And this is important because if somebody, like for instance, somebody earlier in the year wrote to me and said, I'm putting on a show in Estonia. This is all true. Estonia, where's that? Well, it's in the Baltic Sea. You have to look at it on a map. It's in Europe. It used to be part of Russia. Uh, well, USSR. So he says, I can give you all this. I can give you this much. And um, I'll provide the band. I said, great. And I was on the point of buying my air ticket, my round trip air ticket to Estonia from California, which is quite expensive. I can imagine. And something stopped me. Mm. <laughs> I said, just a minute. I haven't heard much from this guy. Maybe I'm not sure this show is actually going to happen. As it turned out, the guy canceled the show and then demanded his deposit back. He'd already sent, I, I, I put the gig eventually through my agent. He said, Peter, we'll only consider doing this if you give us 50%. And this is what most agencies do. In fact, all agencies do this. So I, um, I held off and buying the air ticket, which is a lucky thing because the promoter canceled the show the next day. Did he get his money back? And he wanted his money back. Yeah. He didn't get his money well, back. Thankfully, because if yeah. you know anything about agents, yeah. they're very hard nosed. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. There's nothing <laughs> sentimental about being an agent. <laughs> and they say, no way. In well, fact, you owe Peter the rest of the money because he's now given up this entire weekend for you that he can't work now because it's too late to get another show. So in the end, I got the deposit. I ended up splitting it with the band. That was because I figured that the yeah. band was going to be out of pocket. Yeah. Well, or, that's you know, a at least gesture. At least missing the, yeah. the gig. So this is a very good reason. I know some guys do all their own booking, but this is a very good reason to have an agent because it, it inures you from big losses. Like, you know, we have to buy air tickets. I do this all the time, actually. I, I pretty much book all my own air tickets and for the band. I've just learned to do this, and it's very easy online. Is there a benefit to that? What's the, the benefit? The benefit is that you know the exact cost. Oh, okay. You're not farming it to a travel agent who will book you a ticket, and then you realize later, I could have got a cheaper right. one right. To doing it this way. And you know what time you want to leave. You know what time the band wants to leave. Rather than giving all that information to someone else, it's very easy to go online and buy air tickets, but I like to do at least eight weeks before to get a good price. My manager tells me it's better to wait five weeks because supposing another gig comes in, then you've got to change your air plans. And it's not easy. Well, it is easy, actually. It's very easy to change an air ticket. It just costs you $200 yeah. per ticket. So the business of music, yeah, that's something that I've been doing more and more of, The you know, the actually booking my own hotels and air flights. This is not something I did even 10 years ago. I wouldn't even have thought about doing it. 10 years ago. And the, and the, but was just, the impetus for that though, I mean, was what caused you to, to do that? Um, I did a round the world trip about four or five years ago. 
Washington, D.C. I went to England. Then I went to Japan, back to California. And I saw the price of the ticket. It was like $2,500. I'm thinking, man, I think I could have got, I could have bought a, got a better deal by, by doing one ways. Because I, I learned a lot about booking air tickets. And sometimes, if it's a straight return, sometimes you'll save a little bit of money. But nowadays, it's not like it used to be, where you have to buy a round trip to get a good price. It's not really like that anymore. Or you have to buy over a weekend. A Saturday night stay used to be the big thing. Oh, I so Saturday night stay, then it's cost less because you're a business traveler. Oh, because you're not a business traveler. But it's not really like that. And um, I've saved myself thousands of dollars by instead of booking an open jaw, which means that you fly to one place and come back from another place, book it as two round, uh, sorry, book it as two singles, two one ways. You'd save a lot of money that way. You know, it's just so easy now with the internet to book air travel. It's just, I'm, I just got used to it. Yeah. And, um, and it sounds like it saves and... Uh and also, yeah. very significant. I I hardly ever use a road manager. Ah. Uh, sometimes I do. If it's a come if if it's a collaboration show like with Huge Groove, which I do a lot of shows with him, or Keiko Matsui, or Rick Braun, or any one of these other you know lots of great musicians that I that I collaborate with often. Um, yeah, we'll have a, a road manager, and it's probably easier that way. But if it's just me and my show and my band, I won't take a road manager. Don't really need one. I do everything myself. Plus, I will hire guys close to where I'm playing. Like if I'm playing in Washington, D.C., I know a great bass player in Washington, D.C., uh, David Dyson. He will play my show. No problem. No rehearsal. He'll just come in and play my show. Uh, Chris Geit, keyboard player in Connecticut. Anywhere I play on the East Coast, I can call on him. And he will come and play for me. I don't have to buy a round-trip air ticket from California. Uh, he just drives down. I pay him uh, some a nominal amount for gas, get him a hotel, and he does my show, and we've never had a rehearsal. Wow, he just great. learns my music. Having all your music on MP3s, having a Dropbox folder, having all your charts in order, having a live version of your song, this is all very important. Then you can say to someone, hey, I'm sending you a Dropbox link. Look in the folder, you'll find everything you need. You'll see a chart, you can hear the studio version, then you can hear the live version. But really, everything you need to know is on the chart, and I write all my own charts. And that's very important too, because you constantly have to update charts because arrangements change. Yeah. You don't want to go to a gig and say, oh, by the way, I've changed the key. Nobody wants to hear that <laughs> <laughs> just, just before showtime. <laughs> I don't know if I can play in a different key. Well, you have to. No, but you, you warn them, you send them the chart. If the chart has to be changed to a different key, you change the key. It's not that difficult with computer programs. You know, when I started, it was all by hand. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. Uh, having the charts correctly written hey write the ending on the chart i don't want to have to talk about the ending i don't want to have to sit there playing the ending 20 times so that you'll remember it i'll write it into the chart now everybody does their homework before i even pay guys even before i get to the gig look we're not going to do a rehearsal but i'll pay you another 100 bucks 200 bucks depending on the length of the show if you learn these new songs because the last thing we want to do is rehearse. <laughs> Nobody wants to rehearse. We've already done that. We've yeah. already done all the rehearsals we ever want to do. We want to play music. <laughs> and generally it works, right? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, a guy will miss this or miss that, but not, you know, you'll get that in any show. And chances are the audience will never catch it. But it makes it possible for me to go and play places. Like I'm going to play in Mallorca. Uh, no, I played in Mallorca already. I'm going to play in Algarve. That's in Portugal. I'm going there in October. I'm going to play with a band that some of whom I've played with, some of whom I haven't. Most of them are English. And we're going to have maybe two hours to rehearse a one and a half hour show. Wow. That's enough time to run through every song once and talk about it for about a minute. <laughs> That's, That's it. it. That's fast. And at the level at which we do things here now in smooth jazz, that's pretty much what you get. You don't get five days of rehearsal. You get two hours. You have got to have your charts so perfect because every mistake that's in the chart costs you five minutes in rehearsal, talking about it, figuring out where's the mistake? Why, is you, why are you playing the wrong note? Oh, it's my mistake. It's in the chart. This costs you five minutes by the time you start up again. So, you know, the less time you spend rehearsing, everybody's happier. Nobody really wants to spend a whole day out of their life rehearsing. Sometimes we do, obviously. You know, if it's a completely new show. But if I'm only adding two or three songs into a show, 
every time I release an album, then I won't bother with a rehearsal. I say, we'll rehearse at the sound check. We'll run these songs. And by the time we run the songs, you will have already listened to the song, looked at the chart, learnt your part, and we're good to go. Yeah. Wow. Now, in the Al Stewart days, <laughs> we used to spend weeks rehearsing because oh. nothing was ever charted. We didn't have any arrangements. We didn't have any endings. We'd go in there and we'd just basically repeat so much that we finally remembered. And it was all repetition. We don't have time to do that now. No, everything's changed. Things changed. Nothing was ever charted. Remember, I remember I never used a chart until what, 1991, I think, or 92. Even when I did my first show that I, that I described to you in Catalina Island, we didn't have charts because these were all guys that had played with me for a while. They knew all the songs. There was no need for me to write a chart. It wasn't until 92, I think, I had to go and play a show in Florida using a band that I didn't know. How did that go? I had to write charts. But these guys were very, very good. It was Warren Hill and his band actually in uh, mm -hmm. Melbourne, Florida. And it went okay because these guys were so good and so on top of it that they followed the charts. And it was the first time I'd ever used charts in my professional life. And um, even my scribbled <laughs> paper charts, you know, served well at that point. But, you know, later on I, I learned to use a computer program and that helped me immensely in terms of, um, you know, writing arrangements, writing songs, recording, writing charts, learning how to use the computer, which pretty much everyone does. But, you know, I was 40 years old. I never used a computer. I had to learn how to type from scratch. Now it's indispensable. Well, no one ever said to me when I was at school, hey, you should learn to type. <laughs> that was, that was, this may sound sexist, but it was for girls. When I was at school, typing was only for girls who would become secretaries. Yeah, well, I mean, that's horrible. I mean, today, no one ever said, oh, you should learn to type. Oh, no. I'm not, I'm, why should I learn to type? I'm never going to type. Why should I type? Well, <laughs> now we know. <laughs> now we know. Now we know. Um, so, Peter, I, I always like to kind of uh, end these interviews pretty much the same way I start them, a little different uh, topic. But, uh, I mean, bottom line is you've had a very long and successful career in many ways. And if it were me, I would certainly say uh, you have a long way to go because I know I do. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm a bit older than you, so... Um, slightly. Yeah, slightly. Um, but I want to know, um, I guess, how do you see the future for Peter White? What's going to happen? At least, uh, what do you think that's going to happen? We're in terms of direction, that kind of thing. It's kind of open-ended, so I'm going to let you take it. Somebody asked me the other day if I was ever going to think about retiring. And I had to think about that for a moment. Because no, I never thought about retiring but what does that mean? What does it mean to, to retire? Um, surely it means that you stop doing what you don't want to do and you only do what you want to do. And in that case, I'm already retired. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Cause, <laughs> cause I, I'm, I'm doing what I want to do. And I, don't, I don't do what I don't want to do. It's, uh, and I'm very lucky in that respect, extremely lucky. And you love what you do, um, right? Yeah, I love what I do. I have shows pretty much every weekend. I'm out there playing somewhere, we, you know, and I'm home during the week. Sometimes, you know, it's a few weeks here, on, like my Christmas tour that starts the day after Thanksgiving and goes through till Christmas. That's almost four weeks. So I might be away for a few weeks, but I'm always home. I'm always, I'm always home more than I am away if you take the year as a whole. So I like what I'm doing and, um, you know, recording an album, occasionally recording songs here and there, collaborating with the greatest musicians in the world because they really are. Um, I'm on the Smooth Jazz Cruise and the Dave Cos cruise, uh, I just did both of those earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And to be asked to be on those, either one of those cruises is the greatest honor that you can get because they could hire anybody, and they do. Denise Williams was on there, Jeffrey Osborne. Oh, wow. That's the name I haven't heard uh, in a while. Yeah. Um, well, Chris Bode, of course. Sure, yeah. of course. Fantastic. And uh, well, Rick Braun, Richard Elliott, all the guys that I've kind of grown up with in the last 20 years, uh, Jeff Lorber. I mean, David Benoit, the list goes on and on. Um, these are the greatest musicians in the world. And me, a poor boy from England who learned to play the guitar by listening to the Beatles on the radio, I'm sharing the same stage with these amazing musicians. And, and I have to pinch myself every time. It's, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm a fan. You know, I'm a music fan. I love music. Playing with the best musicians in the world. Yeah, the traveling gets you down sometimes. <laughs> You know, when you have to get up at four in the morning to go to the airport. But I just hope to keep doing what I'm doing. And 
you know, I look at Mick Jagger. You know, he's 10 years older than me. He's still out there doing it. So, Well, don't you uh, believe that when, you, that when you're really truly doing what you love, it really gives you uh, life extension? Yeah, because what you really don't want is stress. And you see people every day who, who have stress and who bring stress on themselves and who worry about stuff. And I think the less stress you have in your life, I think my dad taught me this. He says, I try to try to avoid stress, son, he says, but he did it with cigarettes. And I don't think that was a very good idea. Um, but any way that you can avoid stress, and it, certainly by doing what you love to do and surrounding yourself with people who are there for your, your good, your greater good, people who have your best interests at heart, supportive people, you know, it's hard to find them sometimes. But, you know, my manager has been amazing to me. Um, I've had great companies that I've worked, uh, record companies I work for, great guys that I have in my band. And I don't have a permanent band, but I have a like a rotating cast of musicians that kind of come in and out. And none of them has ever said to me, oh, why didn't you use me for that gig? You know, they all understand this is how it works. And all of those musicians actually play in five or six different bands anyway. So they're always busy. And if you're the best in the world, you will. I'm doing a show tomorrow with... Uh, a drummer called Third Richardson. His name is actually Frank no. Richardson the Third, but I think he's one of the best drummers in the world. I mean, who's better? Jay Williams is another one. Eric Valentine, all amazing. Let's say contemporary jazz drummers, but they can play rock. They can rock out R and B, whatever solo. It's amazing, and I get to stand on stage with these guys. I'm just, I'm a, I'm a Jeff. I'm just a music fan. I just love being in there in the middle of it, and I just. Hope to keep doing this as long as I can. And, you know, it really shows. It really shows on stage. I love watching you perform on stage because uh, you're animated and just positive and all the things that just really contribute to, to the show. You have tremendous, if I can say, stage presence, which is, you know, a real technical term. But, I mean, you you just, you know, it shows. It really shows. And so... I am uh, uh, watching videos myself. I'm sometimes thinking, man, I'm, I've got to slow down a little bit. I'm way, nah. too, <laughs> way too animated here, jumping up and down. Do I really need to do that? But, you know, when the music starts, I can't help it. Even though sometimes I'm tired as hell and I've been playing, you know, traveling all day, we've done the setup, the sound check, I've done, and I'm now on the second show of the evening and I'm just exhausted. And by the way, this is a big part of being a professional musician that no one has ever asked me. What's the hardest part about being a professional musician is you've got to learn to play when you're exhausted because very often you will be. Yeah. Being a professional doesn't mean that everything is in place. Everything is perfect for you. It's the opposite. Play to your very best. The audience who's sitting there don't care how long you've been up. They don't want to hear excuses. They don't want you to say, oh, I'm so tired, I can't. No, they want to hear a good show. So you just learn to play when you're tired. And when the music starts... I just get energized, you know. Sure. I sometimes, I have said uh, before that I, I walk on stage feeling like I'm 25 and I walk off stage sometimes feeling like I'm 75. <laughs> <laughs> because, because uh, you know, I've put everything into the show. Yeah, and it shows but, too. Um, and it's, it, yeah. it's, it, it's remarkable. Well, and just being, you know. being relaxed on stage is the, the, the one thing I would tell anybody. You know what? If you can learn to relax on stage, you're going to play at your best. And I've had to fight this. I'm sure lots of people had to fight this. You know, you tense up, you get nervous. You have to fight that. That's the one thing that's helped me in my on stage playing. Try and be as relaxed as you are when you're in the studio and you really have to work at it. Very important. Well, it makes a difference. It really does. Look, yes. I, uh, I know that I've taken a lot of your time, even more than I, I thought. But I'm so grateful to uh, you know to have had this conversation. Uh, incredibly interesting. I've learned so much about Peter White tonight that I didn't know, and I've been a fan for you know as long as I can remember, which is you know only 25 years. <laughs> is, well, at, at our age, that's all you do remember. <laughs> and I'm grateful I can remember that much. But um, not that we're old. I mean, um, I, I still like no. the middle age concept. So we're we're gonna, middle we're, age. <laughs> My wife said, "Middle age? You're crazy. Yeah. You're way beyond that." Well, okay, <laughs> they they can think what they want, but uh, at any rate, I hope that we'll have a chance to uh, to catch up down the road. I know we could have probably gone on longer, 
But uh, it's been such a pleasure, and uh, I know that our listeners are going to really, really enjoy this uh, show. So uh, best of uh, luck and all of those things with your show tomorrow and, uh, and, and going forward. And I'm going to certainly look forward to uh, catching up with you in the very near future. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, and thanks for having me on your show. It's been a pleasure. Welcome back to the back of the show, where if you made it this far, you're probably willing to take a chance on unpredictable topics and discussion that you might not necessarily expect on a guitar related show. So once again, another terrific interview, and I'm certainly grateful to Peter White for taking time out of a busy schedule to do the show. And again, we could have gone on a lot longer, I'm sure, but we do have some time constraints here. Well, Peter had so many important lessons from his own career that I'm sure many of you will find them not only interesting, but valuable in terms of your own careers or aspirations. And for others, the part we often refer to as the inside baseball stuff can be engaging, even if playing is not your business. And just as often, I think many of these lessons or experiences do apply on a much broader scale so they can be of benefit to many in their own situation. You know, I titled the episode, Peter White's Incremental Rise to Prominence. And you might remember that he said on more than one occasion that the changes and growth in his career were so slow that it was hard to notice the difference until you could stop and look back to see from where you've come. And this, of course, goes back to what I've said ad nauseum here on the show about foundations. But you can see from his career path that he was building on his own foundation for the first 15 to 20 years of being a professional musician. There weren't any really dramatic highs or lows, but look where he is. He's in a great place, doing exactly what he wants to do and loving it. That's certainly something to aspire to, don't you think? Now, I'm not saying this is the best or only way to live a life. I'm not the judge of that. You are. But I think there's something good to be said for incremental growth. It's not a sacrifice. There's no reason you can't experience life to the fullest extent if that's your destination while continuing to add to your own foundation even a little at a time along the way. And keep in mind, I'm not explicitly defining what that is. It's different for each person, but it is a state of mind. In some ways, it's kind of like exercising. It's most important that you at least do it on a regular basis. You can always fine tune what kind of exercise you're doing, And once you've been doing it for a while, usually the discomfort is in not doing it. Now, last week, we talked a lot about relationships with Nathan East and what a positive effect that's had on his career. And you can see that with Peter as well, as he describes the threads of his own relationships and how they were so integral in connecting the puzzle pieces for him. What's the lesson here? Treat people well. It's not always about you. Be of service to others where you can. But that doesn't mean take care of everyone first at the expense of your own well-being. That doesn't work either. It's a balance like so many things. Only you can ultimately determine what that balance looks like, but it always seems to start by living a principled life at the core. You know, we're living in some really heated times right now. I don't know where it's ultimately going, but it feels like it's getting hotter. I don't get into partisan politics on this show, But I've said before, for me, the solution is probably not going to be found by going left or right. Because, of course, going in either direction to an extreme lands you in exactly the same place, just peddling a different brand of tyranny. So I've said for many years now, many times, the direction we really need to be going is up. We all need to rise above this. That's where the solution is, in my view. And while you're thinking about that, As always, stay positive, stay focused on the destination, but keep all your options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you again on Episode 30. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com. 